break. I don't like this. Whoa! What's happening? Whoa! Where are we? Okay, so uh, this evening it's Wade and I, and uh, James is uh, on sabbatical. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, I thought this is a tonight show is something that I've been wanting to do for a while now, um, where I talk to Wade about role playing games, uh, specifically tabletop role playing games. Uh, it's something that I've been peripherally interested in in a while, and Wade is is our local expert. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you categorize yourself? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean. Sure. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, I'm a big old dork. I. Yeah. Well, you've got. So I hear you have questions about the. <laughs> like sit around, turning my chair around, sitting in it backwards, and so you want to you want to hear about a uh, some some tabletop RPGs. Huh? Yeah, and for the sake of discussion today, I think uh, because there's you know there's the distinction between D and D, and then you know D and D is a brand and a game within the larger tabletop RPG world. But it's like sure, you can just say D. You know, it's yeah. like baseball. Baseball. Baseball is a game, but everybody talks about the MLB. Nobody's talking about the Pacific Coast League or South Korean baseball. Whenever they talk about mm-hmm. baseball, they talk right, about it. Right, right. And I think it's it's similar to say for D and D. Was that is that a, a correct assumption? Yeah, more or less. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, some nerds might get mad about that, but no, nah, because I mean, there's role playing games for science fiction and Traveler and and all and everything in between. You know, every every IP nowadays has got some lonely nerd that is going to make an RPG out of it that they sell to like three people and, and nobody ever plays okay. it. Okay, well that that yeah. kind of gets into my that kind of dovetails nicely into my some data that I was kind of going through uh, just in, in, in prepping for tonight. Uh, I kind of want to hit you with this. This is a, an article about Wizards of the Coast. Uh-huh. And uh, they're, I guess they're owned by Hasbro now. They are now, yeah. And they they are the current owners of D&D, right? Uh-huh. That's yes. The Wizards. Okay, so uh, in a conference call uh, with interim uh, CEO Rich Stoddard, uh, they told an out an Analysts at Tabletop Games accounted for 74% of the $1.3 billion in sales for the segment uh, in 2021, um, which grew at a blistering 44% rate. Oh, yeah. It's been insane. Yeah. Digital games were 26% of this segment and grew at a slower but robust 36% rate. So um, that was the first bit of information I wanted to talk about. They are you know the biggest name in tabletop rpgs is doing an ungodly amount of of business how big is the D community well according to dungeonvault.com there are an estimated three million tabletop <laughs> Dun- dungeon bolt that sounds like a biased uh publication but <laughs> <laughs> right yeah uh, well, this is from 2019. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's probably... There are th- an estimated 3 million tabletop dungeon masters worldwide. The average D&D group consists of five players and a DM. There are, are an estimated 3.7 million active tabletop D&D players. Um, the April 13th, 2022 report that Dungeons and Dragons was actually purchased by Wizards of the, of the Coast for uh, $146.3 million. Uh, so, like, that one thing alone is is a huge part of their portfolio. Uh, if you look mm-hmm. on the... Uh, this is a, from a website called uh, Drama Dice, which uh, has a nice article about search uh, queries on Google about which there's like 500,000 D&D related uh, you know uh, queries and the second one is Shadow sure. Shadowrun at 90,000 Starfinder at uh 60,000 Pathfinder at uh 40,000 huh. Call of Cth- Cth- oh, uh, how do you say that C- Cthulhu. Cthulhu, yes, I'm sorry. Call it Cthulhu. Is that 30,000 Star Wars RPG? Star Wars, which is, you know, like a, mm-hmm. the biggest thing on the planet for like our entire lives is only at 30,000 uh, 30, uh, Blades in the Dark, which is something I've never even heard of. Is it 20,000? 
I've heard of that one. Stars Without Number, 15,000. Uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, 15,000. Mm-hmm. Cyberpunk Red, 15,000. Uh-huh. Das Swarsh Og, uh, 15,000. Dungeon World, 12,000. And Warhammer is at 10,000. Um, the huh. Warhammer role playing, not to be confused with the tabletop game. I think so. Because I think that's I think that's yeah, what, yeah, it, yeah. what it yeah, is. Yeah, that makes sense. Because 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 the Warhammer miniatures game does pretty well. But yeah, right. Yeah, but Warhammer gaming probably does. Yeah, that that sounds about right for those numbers. So my my whole point yeah, with that's... with all the this, this data is is that this is. Just a, like if you're not playing Dungeons and Dragons, right. there are millions, li- millions of people who are, and it makes an ungodly amount of money. Yeah, and most of those, most of those, like that you just recited. Well, there after it was Shadow Run, which is its own kind of thing. But then after that, Starfinder and Pathfinder are basically D and D as well. Like probably Starfinder was so high in the search results that from that article you found because it had just been released around that time i think ah uh, and it's yeah, yeah well so and it's a, yeah whatever i don't have to go into it i from the outside looking in um i kind of wanted i've always kind of been kind of curious about it and it's only gaining more steam in the public consciousness uh to that point there's a, an extremely extremely popular a uh, podcast called Critical Role. It's a, it's a show that I've never listened to. Yeah, yeah. Um, Critical Role has an estimated net worth of over yeah. f- uh, fifteen million dollars. Uh, oh, it's, it's worth noting that Critical Role is an LLC and has multiple stakeholders from Twitch, merch, and YouTube alone. Critical Role makes a hundred and sixty-four and seventy-seven dollars per month. That was from March nineteenth, twenty twenty-two. So, yeah. not only is D and D a big uh, thing in and of itself, D and D based entertainment has emerged in the last few years as something that's so big that from the outside looking in, you cannot escape it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we are Star Trek people, and and you know we like Star Trek adjacent things. A couple <laughs> years ago, Humble Bum- <laughs> Bundle uh had a deal for a Star Trek uh tabletop rpg like bundle and it was really affordable what was it wait it was like five bucks and you get like a bunch of bunch of books yeah i can't remember which one i i did but yeah i got a bunch of those books and i read i, I first read them this afternoon where i just flip it through so well yeah yeah and i and that was my whole thing i was like okay this is cool this is, seems like a proper entry point this was probably in 2020 i think when this happened this has been two it's yeah. been two years now that this has been it's been a while yeah yeah we're like oh we should do something with that yeah <laughs> or, or at least take a look at it or whatever yeah. but i right. i opened it up and i was like wait a minute what the fuck is there yeah there's not one manual here there's several manuals here i don't understand how they relate to each other now the first manual says the role-playing game starter rules and the name of this is called star trek adventures the role-playing game um first off let's before we get into the star trek adventures let's let's just talk to me like it uh i'm a kindergartner about what tabletop the the history the brief history of it is it 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 was invented by Gary Gax in the 1970s. Is that correct? That's more or less. There's Gary Gygax, Gygax. and Dave Arneson. We're all getting, yeah, yeah. And it was like an outreach of uh, basically historical miniature battles games like that people make. And then Gygax and was like, oh, what if we do one with like knights? And then he added wizards into it. And it was just like a, it was like Warhammer, basically, like a terrain thing, except like a lot, lot less complicated and then probably, but anyways, it was like just a wargaming thing. And then they added, then there was a thing called Chainmail where they started putting uh, like wizards and art, artillery, magic artillery and stuff. And then Chainmail was starting uh, to turn it into, into just a battle simulator into like a little bit more role-playing though in the early games it was a lot more like depending on whoever i mean every the rules were so complicated and like basically just nobody played the game the same way and to an extent almost you just have to whoever the dm was 
could read the rules and everybody kind of hacked it their own way to an extent. Okay, so the basic the like what is the difference between Dungeons and Okay, so Dungeons and Dragons is you have a book, right? You have like a manual that tells you how to play the game. And then the the people the part or three of them <laughs> or three of them depending on yeah. Well, there's like the dungeon master the classic D&D trifecta is the dungeon master's guide the player's handbook and then the monster manual awesome like, so that's all the things you find. why what, like just nuts and uh, bolts why why not have them in one volume why do you need to have three separate books that's a that's like my next question. well most games that come out now are just like one book and even even D D as it is now it has kind of like a, a legacy they where they keep to that format but like you really only need the player's handbook to play the game. The the dungeon master that's got all the rules that you need to play the game in it. And then now that used to be that the dungeon master had all these extra rules that the players might not know and need to know. And so there's all this extra stuff. But now you just really need the player's handbook, the dungeon master's guides, just extra shit on top of it. You don't need to play the game. So what is a dungeon? What's a dungeon master master called in other games? Uh, usually games master. Sometimes it's the judge, but the game master is just the the GM is because because Wizards of the Coast or Dungeons and Dragons trademark the term dungeon master. Sure. So legally, I don't think any other game could call it. They just call it the game master most of the time. So the game master is somebody who has read everything T to B, right? Usually, I mean, you know, anybody can do it. But that's the thing, like. But like, yeah, when you get your nerds, especially nowadays, you know, that they want to codify everything. And so, yeah, most of the time, the for the most part, the GM is going to be the guy that knows the rules the best. And but then there's there's all these archetypes of players like the rules lawyer is like the guy that's going to be like, no, actually, that's the, the supposed to do it this way. Okay, and, but that goes yeah. into that. that that's most a of, subculture thing. That's that's. That's yeah, yeah, deeper yeah, than yeah. I that I I mean I can fathom right now. Okay, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. the the GM is a guy that creates the world that the I mean if you're gonna they're the computer that the players are interacting with. Okay, so the just, the game that's what that was that goes nicely to my next question, which is the dungeon master or game master is not actually playing the game; they're just like the operating system basically for the game. Well, yeah, but I mean it's just that they're playing. It's just they they're they've got different objectives i guess do <laughs> yeah they they don't have a character though originally it, it, like early D D was a lot more combative to where it was like the gm is actively out to kill the characters and it's all about beating them but most of the time for most role-playing games the the gm is you know once people is there to make sure that the players have fun and you know that everybody has fun and that's part of the fun of for the gm is it you know Hmm. you're you're a giver <laughs> yeah but uh you know you we want everybody to have a good time so you can create your story or your world and pe- people want to have fun playing in it and that's that's the fun that's i think i think from you know for most people i think that's the fun and yeah there people get different things out of it there's the people that just want to kill monsters there's people that just want a story and then there's people that want to interact with the lore everybody brings their own uh, shit to the table basically what like everybody brings what they need to get out of it to the table yeah and then part of it is finding a table or a gm that you mesh with that you want that does the stuff that you want out of it and being a good being a good game master is you know re- reading the room and and you know making it fun for people so when you were simplest thing. when you were doing your live show and for our audience who might, may or may not realize this wade had a live show in brooklyn that was a dnd based uh comedy show where he would he would play a game live in front of an audience and have like rotating guests is that correct is that like a yeah yeah we i mean well we did it in Queens more than we did in Brooklyn, but yeah, oh, okay, same thing. sorry. We did it in Brooklyn too. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Just sorry to get sorry to be pedantic, like a fucking no, no, uh, no nerd over it. Uh, yeah, we did a, a live show. I did. I used to do like a variety show with this comedy team that I did everything with 
when I was doing shows. And then then we started doing a live D and D show where we would play on stage and have like a guest comedian and then often we would inter- invite players from the audience to come up and so we you know we'd have three to f- five people on stage and then like i had a whole setting that i created for that show and then i w- would we'd have the uh conceit would be that in the tavern where all the uh, stories start we'd have the usually a comedian do a part of their show on stage so they could do five minutes and then then we'd go into the uh, that go into the D and D shit. So you were the dungeon master, is that correct for this for this week? Most of the weekend time, and we weekend. we traded out a little bit, but yeah, I was the primary guy. So did the dungeon master, you're in in your capacity as dungeon master. Were you like, were you, are you writing now? What are you doing? Are you writing storylines based off of what is offered in the manual? I guess that's that's my question. Yeah, I mean, depending on. Well, doing a live show where you're not, because I mean, people will, you know, the you can play for hours. Some people will write things out, but you can't write the story because you got to improvise. It's a lot of it's improv- improvising because on the fly, like you might have an outline of where where you think the characters are going, and some people will be more inclined to go with the go with what the GM is laying out for them. Some people are like, no, I want to do this other thing, and depending on the style of game the GM might be like, fuck it, no, I got this thing over here you have to do. Hmm. Or they might be like, all right, you don't want to go to the the uh, dungeon that I spent 12 hours uh, prepping oh. for? Fine, I guess we go, are going to go piss in this fountain because that's what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Or- oh, so so you have to, like, there's got to be, there's got to be a, a little bit of, like, synchronicity then. <laughs> like, you have to, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and part of that is just like being upfront about what's going on, what kind of game you're playing. Okay. Uh, yeah. And finding people that you mesh with. So, I mean, yeah, people that play enough can figure out what what's going on. Depends on some, some yeah, and newer players are a little more inclined just to be like, uh, tell me what to do. And then the GM will be like, okay, well, here's, here's a monster, go fight it. Or this npc that i've created is telling you this sob story about this dragon in this cave it's pretty obviously that the story is setting you up to go fight this dragon in that cave or whatever so uh a person uh, kind of like a famous twitter person that i think that we've we have shared tweets from mm-hmm. like i think at one point all three of us have seen t- from thomas violence you know who i'm talking about oh yeah 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 yeah, he's got he the serious man, uh, like avatar or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I I saw I I, I saved this this because I he, I know he's making a D and D reference here, but I don't like I can like grok what he's talking about. Do you know the tweet I'm talking about? I have no idea. Okay, I'm gonna read it real quick. It's from Thomas Vi- Violence. I forgive me because whoever posted it, this tweet on Tumblr didn't like they cropped out the date and the time, so I don't know whenever he wrote it. Uh, yeah. But it says, uh, "quote Oftentimes, I look at the skills and knowledge I've cultivated, and feel like that moment when you play an RPG for the first time and you realize you've built a character all wrong after finally figuring out how the game works." So I know that that's more of you know, a commentary on like, you know, figuring out like navigating in real life or whatever, but I don't understand. So yeah, in RPGs, you build your character before the game happens. And and that's where a lot of times that's where game manuals come in. Like, how do you know how to build a character and what goes into that is what my, my question. Uh, Yeah. Well, for depends on the game is the, the, the cop out, but for the most part, most dip games will have character creation rules like there you have your six stats and you roll dice to see what they are or some games most like D now for skews more towards here's a standard point by of how many points are allotted to for your skills it's, it's like it's like with video games a lot of rpgs have, have the same mechanics because when they started ripping off from D or whatever but like so you'll roll like classic D, you'll roll 3d6 and add that up and then that's 
uh, 3d6 like six times or whatever and that's your strength your agility your your strength dexterity uh, charisma wisdom uh, whatever one i'm missing intelligence and and so you have whatever your attributes are and then you say oh my god smart i'm gonna put depending on the game you're like okay i'm gonna be a, you, then you might choose your class as a wizard because you see that he's intelligence and you're an intelligent guy your smart guy is gonna be casting spells so you're like okay uh, i'm gonna cast be a spellcaster or you might be like uh this guy had i put a put all the uh points into strength i'm gonna make him hit things harder you know hmm and it all depends on it all depends on like what the manual said as far as the limits of what characters can do for certain now it's 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 job based is that how i if i understand that basically it's like characters are job based uh yeah i mean in yeah the, in the simplest uh versions of the games so it's like okay an expert i feel like there's there's an in, invisible expert that could the interject in, on this podcast and tell you how you're wrong and you're worried about the like the invisible expert yeah and, but i don't know well <laughs> well because like D D now like mo- the big thing is fifth edition D D, like where you have your background you have your race oh your background you know race like are you an elf or a human or hobbit or whatever oh your background is like your i'm a street urchin or i'm a a noble and then your class is like i'm a wizard i'm a a thief or a rogue i'm a cleric or i'm a fighter just just got with the sword or whatever and they each do different things hmm so yeah interesting yeah, or and then you know, a classic D and D was like, okay, you can pick your class. You have six uh, strength attributes, and you have your class, and that's mostly it. That, or if you're an elf, your class is your race. Because there's no, I'm an elf ranger. It's like no, you're just an elf, and oh. that's what you pick. And elves can do it. But then the games changed a lot, so now everybody you start off like, well, I'm an elf. A uh, cleric, or I'm an elf barbarian, or you know whatever S- weird little class that somebody's cooked up for something. Huh. Yeah. All right. Well, let if you if you do you have the manual in front of you, or is it hard for you? Or like, is it uh for that Star Trek game? Yeah, because I kind of wanted to go through it in a little bit and just kind of like pick your brain about what we're looking at. <laughs> yeah, well, this one confused me. <laughs> oh, no. I, well, it's a whole different system. Oh, no. Yeah, I was like, well, this is not... I mean, it's like I could read 347 pages of it and tell you how it works, but I, I couldn't find just like, okay, just tell me how this... St- I didn't... I'm sure there's... I didn't. I went straight to the core book. Oh, see, which I should have just looked at the easy startup rules. Yeah, I'm looking at the 24 page PDF. Oh, that's what I should have whipped out first. I oh, like, yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, this shit. So I was like, because what you yeah. I, like the bigger book? Like I didn't even mess with that yet because I was intimidated by like this PDF. Is not like the 24 page PDF is intimidating to me? <laughs> right. Yeah, because it's it's a whole different game system because. I, this is by Modifus, I think, is the yes. publisher on this one. It, and they have a whole system that, that they use just for all their own uh, properties, which they have a lot of. I think I think the Dune RPG that came out with the movie is by them. Oh, so they have a proprietary system that they could shoehorn license worked into. Yeah. Oh. I think, yeah. I think that's what, the, yeah. Is that bad? Have you ever played? I think they had a Doctor Who one for a while. Have you ever played a? a mo- I haven't. I I've heard. I think I've heard people like this the Star Trek one. I think. Um, I, I, I don't think I like the system so much. It's a little bit more. Most mostly now, D and D is like okay. You have a D twenty. You have a target number. You roll the D twenty. You add your modifiers, based on whatever your attribute is, and. If you hit that number with a D twenty, then you succeed. Okay, see, this says this says Star Trek. Okay, Starfleet needs a new crew. Star Trek Adventures is a role playing game using the two D twenty system. Is that similar to what you're talking about? No, it's a different system for this one. So it's a it's probably. But D twenty is a similar. It's a die. Oh, okay, that's a... yeah, it's the same. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's the die that you roll. Yeah, 
D and D nowadays has a a two D. They have a advantage disadvantage me- mechanic to where if something's hard, you roll two 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 D twenty and take the lower uh, die roll, or if you have advantage for you gain an advantage somehow, you roll two D two D twenty and take the higher one. Hmm. Uh, this is a different. This is. I think it's like a more closer to a dice pool system, which I don't have a lot of there's, familiarity with. I've played a few games. Yeah, there's where, there's a challenge dice, uh, like aspect yeah. to it. Um, th- it's probably really simple once you uh, grok it, but like, but I don't quite have a feel for this one just yet. You know, the char- each character has several statistics, include uh, indicating their competency with uh, different physical and mental attributes as well as their expertise in various disciplines attributes a character has six attributes ranging from seven to twelve that's classic D and it's all they're probably variations on the classic ones their control daring fitness insight uh presence and reason okay yeah so yeah you think that there's analogs probably analogs to those yeah um the disciplines um, the star, tr- star a character has six disciplines based on their training in Starfleet: command, con, security, engineering, science, and medicine. Um, and then there's focuses. Focuses represent specialized subjects about which the character has more precise knowledge or expertise. These focuses can be any topic, excuse me, and apply to any attribute plus discipline combination where focus is relevant to the task. Examples, astro navigation, astrophysics, cybernetics, diplomacy, Mm -hmm. espionage, EVA, uh, exotectonics, uh, genetics, hand phasers, hand to hand combat. Like that's kind of, I don't know. I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool that you could have a character built who I guess, depending on the story, is an expert in genetics, right? Like, if, yeah. So, is the goal to re to is to like create your own Star Trek episode, essentially? I yeah, that's exactly what it is. I think. Okay. Yeah, the game master basically is out. You probably get an outline to the plot, and then you yeah. This it purports to be very character based, I think, from what I was reading. But it's basically that's up to your players to, you know, build their little. Because this one, this one, you're you're basically building your own uh, bridge crew. Hmm. But I think it's it got rules set up so like if you have five players and each one's a major uh, character on the bridge, but like maybe the ensign that's or pilot that maybe the Sulu doesn't go down with every uh, away mission. So you might have a red shirt one off uh, no name guy that you also play <laughs> when, when they go on an away mission. Oh, And then you might set up a, uh, well, it's like, okay, and now I'm going to set up this scene in the ready room to where I'm me. The uh, GM is going to play an ad role that's coming in with a message. And I'm going to tell you, Oh, the, the Cardassians over here, have uh, started up a blockade. Uh, we're sending your ship, Captain Bleep Blop, uh, you know, right. <laughs> played by, uh, you know, Jeff or whatever. So Captain Jeff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Captain Jeff. All right. So uh, what are you going to do about this Cardassian blockade? We're sending your ship over. And then, you know, the, the, Cardass- the guy might say, well, okay, uh, we're going to go... Uh, go, yeah, we'll go over there, and then some Jordy guy is like, "Well, I think I'm gonna use my astro uh, engineering to say try this." This know. is also interesting because it, uh, there's there's starship combat, which makes it different than is that yeah. different? Then that's different than D and D because there's no vehicles that you like the group controls, right? Like, is that unique? I mean, there's there's probably real. There, I mean, there's. Probably yeah, not in the core rules. No, I'm sure there's ha- there's home people have homebrewed hacks to do uh you know pilot in magical spaceship and that's like uh one setting, but but yeah. Okay, so for the most part, that's that's kind of cool that you have like a yeah, yeah. like a spaceship that you have to manage. I guess yeah. Um. All right. I kind I kind of get it, it really like looking at this 24 page PDF 
it's talking about like systems uh starship profiles with systems and departments and focuses and power and support and crew scale resistance shields and then it talks about like that's even before you get into uh the operating the starship with piloting and navigation scanning objects and phenomena other tasks right so it seems like it just seems like this is very uh involved yeah moving over to the like i just kind of want to bring up you don't have to bring it up i just kind of wanted to Sure. Uh, bring up the original series character book is something that comes with this right player character 2.6 megabytes is this it's the the crew of the uss uh, enterprise ncc 1701 you've got the original series characters captain james kirk commanding officer um and then there's some like just vague like bits of business in this in this description like values i don't believe in a no-win situation married to enterprise risk is our <laughs> business there's no such thing as the unknown so uh and spirit of discovery you can spend one determination to add three points to the momentum pool the normal conditions for spending determination still apply so it's like starts with one on the det determination skill it just seems like uh a lot to remember right yeah there's th pro most of it's probably pretty simple it's just like oh you're playing this is like i don't believe in a no-one situation okay that's just like it's just that's what your character that's how you're gonna role play your character it's like just a hard ass when <laughs> somebody says you can't do that and you just go oh i'm gonna be I'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna fight back against that. So character. that that's where there's yeah. a little bit of like fidelity to the to the character sheet where where like yeah. So that's why it's important for that those kind of descriptions to be in like just like to help you like a, like an actor's motivation essentially. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. There's a lot. Of, yeah. Some games will have like mechanics built in that that re kind of reward playing a two character, and then some of them might be more open ended where you just do whatever. But yeah now in this why why do they have these classic characters is it just because they just assume that players think it's fun to like be their favorite characters or can you actually just make a like a new ship out of like whole cloth and new characters and a new crew um, you can do that i'm pretty sure they probably have pre-gens for yeah because people want to play Kirk and the, everything. But yeah, going through the core book, there's like character creation rules in one chapter that, uh, yeah, I'm sure you can play whatever, you can play what, you know, if you want to be an Andorian uh, scullery mage, you can probably find a way to do it. <laughs> an Andorian scullery maid, that that would be awesome. <laughs> I don't know what that... Actually, I hope, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's like the that's that's Rom cleaning the uh <laughs> sure the uh the mop in the mop on the holodeck. Uh, holodeck. Yeah, I guess you could do that. Uh that would be that would be pretty fun. Um how long does it take to set one of these up if you're a game master? Like it seems to me that or, or, okay, there's two different questions I got about about this. Like so if you're a and d player, like you've been playing mm -hmm. like your entire life, like since you could read, right? Like you were a kid playing D&D, &D, right? Yeah, it was kind of bullshit. It was me and Lane bullshitting it, just the two of us, because cause we were kids in the 90s when Magic came out and nobody played D&D &D, and it was not cool. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, not where we were anyways. It was like... Sure. No, no, no. It 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 was It yeah. wasn't... Yeah, the uh, satanic panic really took over in the south. Like even yeah, right. I, yeah, I was there for that. Because so. I, I was into it, and you know, me and Lane obviously were. And then, but we had like my oldest brother, who's twelve years older than me. We had these leftover books from like the early eighties with before before the satanic panic really shut everything down. Like. D and D was really popular. Like the popular, my brother was like a popular kid at school, and everybody had it and played it. And then they grew out of it and threw it all away, and just like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. Sure. And then I, my brother and I picked it up. You know, like, 
but like by the time you know we were in high school it's like that it wasn't a fad anymore that any oh no 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 it would definitely no, it was yeah. that was definitely not yeah and then when we were in high school like everybody was starting to play magic and i was like i don't want to play wizard fight cart games i want to tell a story you know like these game books that i read when i was a kid because but then so blaine and i would like i one of us would be we'd do solo like one of us would be the dungeon master leading only the uh, one person through a dungeon or whatever, where is, which is harder to do but. where is the player acumen come into like if you're a player if you're a D player like how do you what does a good D D player look like 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 somebody who go, comes into a game and it's like is good at playing D. like what does that even look like if you're good at it well does it mean are you the are can is, are you the person that can like build that character sheet like Thomas Violent says like I he gets into a game and he can't uh like yeah. he's ill equipped is like the good player uh is able to depends on the game like there's a certain in three point five three third edition especially you got really into the system mastery of it all and a lot of people now are just like really into building their characters above playing the game. And like, oh, I've opt, I've min maxed this guy into being. Uh, he's got those. He's gonna hit the hardest because I put all the points into here, and he's got a plus five ability score. So I'm, and you know, and, and for organized play or certain games, that's like that's, or certain GMs even that are kind of like built it just to be like, oh, I want to be the best at killing the monsters. That might be a good player. Hmm. Uh, personally, I like. A, people that get more into the storytelling of it like and yeah be like oh well i might not hit the hardest but i'm gonna have the most uh the most creative uh problem. response to the situation yeah yeah some people will go wackadoo and a little bit too creative to the you know they're like i wanna i wanna you know uh well, can I fuck it? That's one kind of player. It's like that it can be fun, but like, no, you can't fuck the rock monster. What are you doing? Okay, uh, so and that's the, the 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 DM or the game master is the one that answers that question. Yeah, basically, the player can say, "I, I, whatever you want to do, try it." That's you're like, oh well, here's the situation. Whatever you want to do, that's the beauty of a tabletop RPG versus computers or whatever. Like, here's here's the situation you're in. What do you want to do? Anything is on. You can try anything within reason. A good GM will say, "Well, okay, yeah, let's." Or if it's something stupid like, "I want to, I want to knock its head straight off over over there," it's like, "Well, you can roll to try to do that, and if you suck, I'm going to come up with a complication that where you you rolled a one when and so you trip on your foot and you you know look like a dumbass." The, the the elf over here laughs at you and okay you're no more, whatever. are there real moments of excitement that can build in these games like depending on like if is everybody like waited on bated breath to see how a roll will go has that ever happened oh yeah that can happen yeah it's for sure i mean if you know if you're in a fight uh where you know quote unquote life or death are on the table like oh you know and then you need to hit and you miss and you know uh then you die <laughs> so i mean some people get really invested in just the fighting parts of it and, sure and then you know like you might try to pull something off like i'm gonna jump off this cliff and do a backflip and you know stab this thing or whatever dumb example but like okay that's really hard to do so you have to roll really well to do it but uh you have to try to do something crazy because you're about dead so you got to do something really good to be able to solve this thing in time so you either have to go big or go home and so yeah the 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 die might have a lot of import there like okay huh uh yeah it seems like that, that there's a real what i guess i didn't realize is that there's a there can be a real focus on like telling the story that like if a, if a game master plotted out something in advance Mm -hmm. and just like leads bread like leads bread like the proper bread yeah. crumbs for the players to participate in the story like it 
Mm-hmm. Is that how is that how it works basically? So yeah, I mean that's that's the dream for some people. Just want to go railroad it on a story where I'm going through this dungeon and we're going to kill all the things, and that's a viable way to play. Uh, personally, I have I like okay everybody's improvising their characters well here's the scenario and we're creating a, like the collaborative storytelling uh aspect of it i find uh rewarding well it seems to me that like couldn't isn't there built if theoretically a star trek game mm-hmm. if there's actually like a chain of command um could that could right. that affect there seems to be for this game yeah could that affect like if you're the captain of a crew like, yeah are you sort are you uh, the captain are you actually the captain of the other players and right that that could be interesting yeah huh yeah i mean it it's, it's, it could be really bad if you have a bad captain sure. I guess, you know you got, but right but i mean ideally you know everybody's in to have a good time so they're not gonna be like okay no you don't get to do anything right I mean, it's fun to show. It's 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 fun to wharf node a guy every time. But if the guy's not into being wharf node, it's gonna kill the mood a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's an but, excellent point. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of you kind of. I mean, but there there could be ways to have that if if everybody's on board and the guy gets wharf node and wharf node. Okay, well I'm gonna do this anyway, and you piss the captain off. Oh, you're going to the brig. You could build a whole story out of that. That could be fun. The the it does seem to me that the appeal to the the appeal is to have the appeal of star trek is working together right 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 so i think that the spirit of that if you're a star trek fan and if you're, if you're a fan enough to play a rpg <laughs> tabletop rpg yeah. that you would want to carry over what you enjoy in the show into the game and i would imagine the spirit of like collaboration might be more yeah, yeah. Uh, present rather than a traditional uh, you know, fantasy based RPG. Right, right. Where everybody's kind of like a like a like a lone bat like wanting to be the lone badass standout of the group. Yeah. I mean th- that rarely works well even in D D, but it happens a lot. Uh <laughs> yeah. I mean to, to, for pretty much any tabletop game, you really need to be able to support the group. Yeah. But some people have trouble doing that and want it to be, you know, like you got to be out, the part of being a, the GM is knowing how to, uh, you know, give every player a moment to shine kind of thing. Hmm. And being a good player is not being the guy. Cause some, some people just don't want to, and just everybody goes to the, some people are like, I really enjoy playing, but I'm timid and I don't like talking that much. So I'm cool just hanging back and being a part of the team and whacking the monsters when I need to and speaking up maybe a little bit. And then some people might be timid and find the game as a whole way to be a whole different way and be like, you know, be very arrogant. It sounds like you're describing somebody who's like a, just like a born red shirt, just born to. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Born to stand at the transporter uh, console and, right. and have two lines to beam somebody down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, that's what you want is for a cleric or a medical uh, officer. I think. Or, like, okay, well, I'll heal you. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good. Instead of the guy that's like, no, I want to shoot. It's like, well, okay, you can rush in there and Leroy Jenkins it, and now we're all dead. Thanks a lot. <laughs> if you had held back and cooperated a little bit more, we may have been able to do something. So that is a possibility that somebody could really just like screw up the game by going off uh, on their with their own agenda. Oh yeah, I've had that kind of like the the DM will allow that. I've I've played with those guys, yeah, like or like you know, guys good guys, but just kind of social weirdos, and it's like, oh, we're all dying, and the guy's like, okay, I'm running away. It's like, but we're all dead now because you ran away, and you just okay, thanks a lot. It's like, oh, but okay. Now how how you know the whole point of the game is to fight. What what are some ways that you can actually if you're if you're a game master, dungeon master, whatever, and you, you can actually set up the game to last like a specific amount of time? Like, what are some tricks to like be like? Let's make this game last like just like an hour and a half or whatever. You know, uh, like, I mean, it's tough. You, you, you well doing it for like doing the live show. It's like we just. F- fuck it we're just i'm not 
and roll in one dice and just saying, okay, well, you killed it. Okay, you died. Instead of trying to get all the, the minutia of the rolls, you have to let some of that go sometimes if you're trying to rush through a quick game. Oh. Because uh, you can, some people, you know, like, <laughs> uh, I think I was playing with James and his kids in Lane one time. And we spent like an hour just trying to cross a tree trunk over a piece of water or something. And it was like, oh my God, <laughs> you can you can get bogged down in little minutia sometimes, but you can also just say, all right, never mind. It depends on, it just depends on the game master, it sounds like. It sounds like the game master really is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it depends on the players too sometimes. Sometimes some players will be like, no, we have to do this thing. It's like, well, okay, well. Oh. Here you go. Let's figure out how to do it. And then, Yeah. It really does sound, yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of. But yeah. There's a lot of wiggle room for for these things to get either become tedious or just calamity. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, tedious and calamity are like two ingredients uh, to a podcast too. So it's no wonder <laughs> yeah, it's right, right. no wonder that they they're like a popular format uh uh for entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that you have um you've kind of explained to me before the miniature aspect of it and i noticed at the back of these pdfs the star trek pdfs they have some cool little miniature oh i didn't you know trek stuff at what point at at what point does the miniatures come into play and what do what what what's that all about i guess is what i'm asking (laughs) it depends like you don't have to have miniatures to play so for fourth edition, it depends on the version. Like some games you kind of do, like if it's uh, just for like, if you're in a combat or something and you want to say, I'm shooting at that guy over there and what's in the line of fire. Sometimes you might have a grid where you're like, well, you're here and you can move 30 feet. So you're going to move over there. If you're in a real strategic kind of uh, gameplay and that's what you're into, it can be good to have a miniature with a grid where you know where everybody's moving to how far away they are. Cause you're like, well, if you're, you have a melee attack, you have to be next to them, but I'm shooting at range. How far away are they? Well, you can put a miniature down and say that you're 60 feet and we know exactly where they are. And, hmm. Or you can just, the, G, the GM can say, well, I, yeah, you're 60 feet away and you can theater the mind it and just kind of improvise off the cuff. But you have a good, you have a good, you personally have a good, like, collection of miniature, like, right? Oh, yeah. I have two, I got a whole shit ton of doll furniture and shit. But part of that is because I really, st- I got, I got back into playing in fourth edition D&D, which was basically, you had to have miniatures to play the game. Whoa, uh, you have to, you have to have the. Pretty much the complaint at the time that people, like, there is a whole edition wars that that the the grognards don't want to go back to like there's third edition was when they got into system mastery or whatever and then they killed third edition around the time that uh world of warcraft was really blowing up so they're they're like basically there people will dispute it but like hasbro or wizards of the coast is owned by hasbro at that time maybe it might be shortly after Hasbro bought them or whatever. I I don't know. Nobody helped me to that, but they're like, oh, World of Warcraft is really popular. How can we make D&D more like that? Yeah, kind of like, so kind of like whenever Instagram tries to like a lot more, yeah. pivot to video because TikTok exists. Like, right, right. The, the so, established beast, the established beast in the field is afraid of the new, the new thing. So they have to like mimic it. Right. Which I had a lot of fun playing fourth edition, but there's a lot more what people would it was like. It's more, it's like more, it's more of a board game than it is a role playing game, like, which is not true, but there was a lot of, uh, tactical decisions and it was a lot of combat base that took forever to do. Uh, so, so I got in, I got really back into D and D then, and I bought a bunch of doll furniture. Basically <laughs> I got a, bunch of cave like 3d terrain stuff and i bought a bunch of kick this belt when my kickstarter problem started kicking in so like i got I, I would you, buy keep, you, you keep that long enough and you have you have like a like enough people in your family to like one day have a good uh regular campaign 
that's i mean that's why i haven't gotten rid of the stuff to an extent uh yeah yeah totally i mean i haven't used it in years too but like it looks cool when you set it up it's just it's a lot of work right <laughs> so I've never done it. <laughs> uh that's funny um <laughs> you uh i think that's pretty much all my questions like i it sounds to me that if we were ever going to play a Star Trek RPG, we would have to have like a good game master that like is up to the task. Yeah. That sounds like the like the key. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I could try to do it at some point, but I I would have to read that core book a little bit more and up to make the mechanics are you roll 2d20 and and you have to have a certain amount of successes for the for the difficulty of the task and so for this game I, system i think you roll a d20 and you want to get below whatever your number is it's kind of like cthulhu too i think but like so if you're really good at phaser combat you might have a skill up in like 16 or something because you're for like your attributes give you a 14 and then your specific phaser skill gives you a plus five. So you've got like a 19. It's a t so you have to roll below a 19 and that gives you one success, but you roll two D 20. So you need three successes to win. So you have to, or you need to, so you roll the two D 20 and you got one success and one not success. So it's a half ass. And so it might not be the, you can't, you don't phaser the thing to make it explode like at the end of season two, of TNG, <laughs> right. but you might, wo you might wound it and it's pissed off. So there's a complication for the next round or something. Why would you have, why would you have diplomacy as a, like, how do you roll for diplomacy? I guess is what I'm asking. Well, in a, in old school D and D would be like, yeah, you just have to role play it and talk it out. And the DM is going to decide whether it worked or not. Oh, that's... But like, but another way, and a lot of uh, systems in more modern versions, like, well, like, well, your character might be really be good at talking, but you as a player are not, and you want to, we, we don't want to, like, just, like, reward the guy that's a little more shy and not going to be able to ah. you know, public speak about it. So, okay, well, give me a, you know, tell me more or less what your guy's talking about, and I will, and we'll roll and see how eloquent you are in talking to this Andorian, this uh, Gorn ambassador or whatever. Right. So, like, okay. Nah. So you could say, okay, I'm going to try to explain water rights to him, and like, okay, well, roll, give me a roll. And it's like, you rolled poorly, and it's like, well, they don't give a shit about water rights, they're going to come after you. Or it's like, oh, you, you might not say exactly what you said, but since you rolled well, I'm going to say, you really keyed into something that their culture really was into uh, because they're from an aquatic species. And because you decided that you wanted to talk about water rights, this is why it worked really well or whatever, because you rolled really well. I'm going to make something up that makes sense for why it works. What's, what's the ideal size? Like what's the ideal size of a, of a, of a crew? Like, is it like a, th if you had like a, a game master and like three people playing, would that be like an ideal game? Probably for D and D that's, like f more or less ideal like i think the, the the stats you gave at the beginning the most games are about five people yeah uh the more people you get the more bogged down rounds will take because everybody's moving and so games it, it games will last longer the more people and it's just more moving parts but uh so three is probably the sweet spot three or four is the stand like yeah one GM and three players was probably the easiest to run, but then depending, like if you have, if every th three of those players is good at, and uh, it working together and being uh, dynamic, but you might have like one guy who's the timid guy who's not going to speak up as much. So right. three, two, two uh, show voters and one timid guy might not be as good as having, uh, you know, right. Three guys and one, yeah but yeah three to three to five is the what you want i'd say three is probably closer to the sweet spot if you have the right people hmm. all right well i can't think of anything else i'm sure I, i'll have more questions one day but <laughs> uh yeah 
Yeah, I feel like I'm not. Yeah, it's it's been yeah. a good. Time. I think I've enjoyed it. It's been it's been interesting. Yeah, and it's definitely something that I'm. Yeah, no, I'm. I mean, I'm into this stuff. I I feel like I'm just being pedantic and just no, talking, no, like, you're, but you've, no, I'm, I I love the shit. No, you've been great. This is uh, Star Trek. I think it lends itself to like maybe a better role playing experience. I think that's my biggest takeaway from this. And I'm kind of comforted by the fact that this particular company uses like a blanket system for all of their like licensed stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause that means I could probably find stuff on YouTube a lot easier on like how to play. Oh yeah. You know, better examples. Right. I, th I think the star Trek one is one of their biggest ones, but I don't know for sure. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm. I definitely wouldn't want to play. I'd want to build my own character. I wouldn't want to be a like a legacy character. Oh yeah, for I'd sure. I'd want to have my yeah, yeah yeah. I'd want to have my own like a like a you know ship. I don't know how you build a ship in this. I guess there's probably an explainer in that. Too. I assume there's rules for it. Yeah. But, all right, man. I think I'm going to hit the hay. Yeah, me too. Uh, but thanks for coming out anyway. Even though we we got a a guy on uh, vacation. Thanks for being patient with my ignorance. Oh, yeah. Happy to anytime. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we can get more into shit later. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe sometime we can figure out how to play something. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I definitely like, like that's that's my whole thing. It's like one. We don't have to do it. Rush into it. We can like peck away at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, All right. right. Sounds good to me. Peace out. All right. Later. Hey, look. A Dungeons and Dragons ride.